what I'll be doing during my talk is, first of all, coming to the point that how to diagnose idiopathic constipation, which is the topic. How to classify that idiopathic constipation and subsequently how to treat it. So it will practically be in three parts. And uh, let me just point out at the very beginning that patients describe their constipation symptoms in varied ways. And doctors have a different perception as well. You will all have seen patients who come to your clinic and say, Dr. Saab, constipation. And then you ask, what exactly do you mean by constipation? So he says that I go four or five times. Khul ke nahi hota hai. So you, the next question you ask it, but what is the consistency of your stool? Stool is either soft or it is sometimes liquid. Now from the doctor's point of view, this is diarrhea, more than three stools per day, soft or liquid. But the patient is saying that he has got constipation. So I think it is very important first to understand the doctor's perspective versus the patient's perspective. And so, there is a general consensus that Rome 4 criteria should be used for diagnosis of chronic constipation. The chronicity is for at least three months or more and includes at least two or more of the following which I have shown over here. So straining at stool, lumpy or hard stools, sensation of incomplete evacuation, and sometimes sensation of anorectal obstruction. Nikalta hi nahi hai. Then they are, the next is patients sometimes use their fingers to take out their stools. And if you look at the right hand side, the traditional definition provided by the West is less than three stools per week. So if you look at the Indian population, it is less than 1% of the population who has less than three uh, stools per week. 90 plus percent have got at least one or two stools per day. If, you, if we don't pass stool on any particular day, that day is practically lost. So I think there is a difference in And therefore, there is an Indian guidance now. How should we really define constipation? It is on the basis of stool form. Is it a hard stool, soft stool, loose stool, etc., And includes the patient's perception rather than the stool frequency. So let us not say that stool more than three times a day is equal to diarrhea or stool less than three times a week is equal to constipation. So let's be very clear on that. And you should all be familiar with the Bristol stool chart. And if you look at the top two, type one and type two, this is classical of constipation. So if a patient has type one, type two stools, then no matter how many times he is going, it should be classified as constipation. Now how common is it? Well, up to 25% of the population at different ages can be suffering from constipation. More common in females, more common in non-working population. He goes to the toilet, comes back, and so on and so forth. Those with poor dietary habits and fluid intake is very important. Those who take less fluid are more constipated. And those who have less physical activity, again, have more constipation. And one very important thing, there is a very strong association with psychiatric issues. So patients with psychiatric problems, depression, anxiety, they have constipation almost in 40 to 60% of such patients. So how do we classify and how do we diagnose idiopathic constipation? So first of all, if you're dealing with chronic constipation, which is constipation for more than three months, you will have two uh, issues. One is the idiopathic constipation, which means there is no definitive cause, or on the right-hand side, it would be secondary constipation, 
which may be due to certain medications or which may be due to certain disease. But we are now talking about this condition and idiopathic constipation is the subject of today's lecture. So how do we classify that? Well, there will be three types and it is important to recognize that so that you can provide proper treatment. One is the normal transit constipation which is commonly called the IBS of the constipation type. The second is slow transit constipation and the third is classified as fecal evacuation disorders. Now I'll come to how to diagnose each one of them but one thing you must remember that each one may not be a distinct disorder that there's a lot of overlap. So a patient who has irritable bowel syndrome may also have slow transit constipation and similarly with evacuation disorders. So that is something which is important to know. And before you can diagnose idiopathic constipation, you must know the other causes, all these causes which can cause constipation. And if your patient has one of these constipation causes, then clearly he is not a patient of idiopathic constipation. And it is also very important to remember in clinical practice the common drugs which can cause constipation. So if your patient is having any of these drugs, and there are some more, I have just shown some examples, then please take care to try and withdraw these drugs and do not just classify them as idiopathic constipation. So the standard algorithm for management of chronic constipation is to take a clear history and do a proper physical examination. And if you find any of the alarm features, alarm features I'll show you are features which are suggestive of organic disease. And such patients may have ulcerative colitis, malignancies, etc. So you must be very careful not to diagnose them as idiopathic constipation. And on the right hand side, try to see whether there are medications or diseases which are causing the constipation. So once you have excluded the right and the left side, you are left with this group, which is the, what we are talking about today. Patients who have got chronic constipation without al any alarm features and without any secondary cause. So a clinical evaluation should include a good perineal examination. And a rectal examination is very important. One of the diagnoses which is very commonly missed is evacuation disorders. And for that, I think it is a very simple method. You put the patient on the left lateral position and do a per rectal examination. Keep your finger inside the anal canal and ask the patient to strain as if they were passing stool. And normally on straining, the anal canal should open up, it should relax. If it is on the other hand contracting and you are getting a squeeze pressure, then that is clearly anorectal dyssynergy or evacuation disorders. And you also look for pelvic floor descent, particularly in females who have born children. So very simple, good history, clinical examination can tell you a lot about the diagnosis. And I've talked about the alarm features. What are they? If somebody is having blood in the stool, clearly do not ignore that. Most patients will tell you that piles are bleeding. And I'll tell you, piles is the commonest cause of bleeding in patients with constipation. But you are still likely to miss other causes and you do not want to miss particularly a malignant disease in such patient. If there is a family history of colon cancer, if the patient has anemia, has fecal uh, occult blood test which is positive, has a history of weight loss, or on examination there is abdominal mass or fever. Or remember another class of patient, new onset constipation in a patient above 45 years of age. Always suspect that there might be malignancy, so they require further investigations. Now, broadly speaking, the treatment, certain things have to be taken into account. We have to look at the fiber intake of the patient and increase the fiber intake. Ask them to drink plenty of water. Fluid intake must be high. 
If they're not exercising, tell them to exercise. Healthy sleep pattern must be maintained. Patients who are depressed, not sleeping, are more likely to have constipation. And they must have regular defecation times. And lastly, and most importantly, I'll tell you, Indian style of toilet is the best in the world. Squatting during defecation is the best way to provide the best pressure and therefore should be, patients should be advised about that. If, because in these days we have western toilets, what we advise is to put a small stool in front and bend your knees so that you are in a squatting position. So how to classify, I have already talked about slow transit constipation and I'll tell you simple. Bristol stool form if you have one and two, that is a clear surrogate of slow colonic transit. So the harder the stool, the slower is the colonic transit. So you don't require any test, just ask them. Do you get the urge to pass stool? Do you get uh, hard stools? And if the answer to these are uh, both uh, yes, then the patient has uh, slow transit constipation. Uh, and if you look at the sensitivity and the specificity of just this history, it is 80% sensitive and specific. So good history is good enough. <clears throat> Remember one thing. Some of the patients will have methane-producing bacteria, and they are the ones who have very foul-smelling flatus. You can diagnose on the basis of breath test as well. Methane inhibits GI motility, and therefore in such patients, you might have to think of giving rifaximin, and removing the, these bacteria can improve the slow transit and therefore improve the constipation. And I'm not going to go into this because we hardly perform this colonic transit study, which is done with radio opaque markers. And you, when you take a X-ray at 60 hours and find more than 20 pellets lying in the right iliac fossa, it gives you a clear diagnosis. So how do we treat slow transit constipation? The stool is hard, the bowel movement is slow. So we need softening agent or a pushing agent that is a stimulant. So osmotic laxatives are first used. Avoid isabgol and high fiber in such patients because they are bulking agents and they will cause more of formation of fecolates. So no bulking agents for such patients. Use osmotic laxatives. Now there are two. One is the lactulose and lactitol and the other is the PEG 3350, polyethylene glycol. Preferable to use polyethylene glycol because most of these patients have got gas and bloating and lactulose is likely to cause, more likely to cause gas and bloating. If they are not responding to that, you have to use the stimulants and these days we are using prucalopride in uh, probably as the next drug of choice and it is given in one or two milligrams at night. You have to be careful in patients who are elderly or have got cardiac disease, but if they're not responding, then the good old bisacodyl and sodium picosulfate, basically dulcolax and cremalax has been uh, going on for many, many years. You have to try, although you cannot give these drugs for a long period of time. If you suspect uh, methane producing organisms, try rifaximin. And if nothing seems to be working, then you have to consider surgery because such patients are undergoing continuous, almost fecolid formation, and therefore they have a high risk of rupture also. So that was about the slow transit. Now we come to the normal transit, which is uh, uh, Rome 4 criteria, recurrent abdominal pain. Uh, and this is again for th previous three months associated with constipation in, this in our case. Uh, and. Uh, this definition is accepted and how do you treat them? Constipation predominant if the fiber intake is low, increase the fiber or use the osmotic laxatives. If they're not responding, you're using either prucalopride or lubiprostone, which is a intestinal secretagogue. And if they're not still responding, then go back to the good old drugs, dulcolax or cremalax, but use them uh, for a shorter period of time 
But most importantly, many of these patients who have IBSC are more troubled by the pain in the tummy rather than the constipation. So address the patient's concern. Abdominal pain, if it is the major problem, then use the antispasmodics and mebeverine is the commonest drug which we use. Otilonium bromide or pinavarium bromide is also used and anticholinergics as the last choice because they have got their own side effects. If you are to use antidepressants, don't use uh, the TCIs, but use the SSRIs because TCIs uh, can cause uh, worsening of the constipation. And for those with gas and bloating, use rifaximin. Use a low FODMAP diet. Half a minute, if you permit. Not on grounds of empathy, but on grounds of constipation. Straining. <laughs> Uh, lastly, we have to subdivide into the third category, which is fecal evacuation disorders. And remember that this is not because we don't diagnose this very commonly. So 30 to 40 percent of patients with chronic constipation have got fecal evacuation. So there is an incoordination between the anorectal muscles, more common in females. And these patients are typically have prolonged straining, incomplete evacuation. Sensation of anorectal uh, obstruction and digital evacuation is very, very, uh, I would suggestive of you know, evacuation disorder. So digital examination, as I've already mentioned, is highly predictive. And then if you have suspicion, use the anorectal manometry, balloon expulsion, and MRI defecography, et cetera. And the treatment for dyssynergic defecation is pelvic floor muscle retraining, biofeedback. And then if you have a combination, treat dyssynergia first, add the prokinetics if they are unresponsive, and you have to consider surgery in very severe cases. So this are the, I've just told you that three categories are there to classify how to treat them. I will avoid this for want of time. Lots of people are using probiotics. What is the status? Well, they appear to be very useful probably, but the current data does not support their regular use. But I think in times to come, they will become an important drug. Lastly, what about these enemas and suppositories? Well, for patients who have got severe constipation, we all use them, uh, but usually as an adjunct therapy, not as a primary therapy. So what is the take-home messages? The take-home messages make a proper diagnosis of idiopathic or functional constipation, then classify the chronic constipation for management strategy, determine always the, what is the patient's main concern and address that. Treatment should always be aimed to target the main concern. So if the patient is troubled with pain, please address the pain first. Stimulants are used predominantly for slow transit constipation, secretagogues, osmotic laxatives, uh, fiber, etc., are all used in patients with IBSC, and biofeedback is the treatment for dyssynergia. Thank you very much.